Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Allure of the Poor. I am your host, Lori, UC Wine Davis graduate, owner of Dracina Wines, Someday Certified, and WSET Level 2 Certified. And today, I am sitting down with Ara Sarkissian, who is from Storica Wines, and we are going to learn about Armenian wines. So hello, Ara. How are you doing? Hi, great. Great to see you. Glad to be here. Nice to see you. And I can see your back out there. It looks like a pretty nice day where you are. Where are you located? I, I am in Boston. I'm in the suburbs of Boston. And it's a very rare sort of mild day. It's neither cold nor hot, which almost never happens. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. I actually love Boston. I'm originally from Jersey. So um, we used to do a lot of a lot of vacationing up there. I love walking around and seeing everything that's there. So I know what you mean. Come for a visit. All right. All right. So let's get into this a little bit. So you are um, head of wine at Storica Wines. So can you tell me a little bit about what that title means and a little bit about Storica Wines before we get into Armenian wine? Sure. Yes. So very briefly, uh, head of wine, it just means I'm sort of the wine guy, the main wine guy, I guess, in the company. I'm, I sort of... Uh, deal with communication with the wineries. I taste a lot of wines that we potentially would like to work with. I ensure that the wines are in good condition and I write blurbs about the wines, tasting notes and things like that. And we ensure to sort of, uh, you know, create materials that discuss the wines for, for salespeople and for the trade overall, that's my role. Um, and about Storica Wines. So, so Storica Wines is an importer of wines from Armenia. We've only been oper in operation for slightly over a year. And uh, our aim is to introduce the fine wines of Armenia into the US market. So technically we're an importer, but we also have a very strong sort of uh, uh, angle in sales and marketing because we believe this is such a new category. Many people, possibly even people listening to us right now may not really know where Armenia is or the fact that Armenia makes wine or that Armenia makes very good wine, right? Or that it has a very old history of making wines and growing grapes. So so we at Sorica think that, you know, importing and selling isn't just the end of it. We need to educate people and introduce people to the place, the history and the traditions and the wines so that the import business actually succeeds. So it's a category setting sort of exercise. And we've sort of made it our goal to make sure to sort of inform people across the country who are interested in wine that these wines exist. And uh, I'm going to be the first person who admits I don't know where Armenia is. So let's start off with that. Where is Armenia? How large is it? Tell me what, what it's about. Yeah, so Armenia is uh, in what is referred to as the Trans Transcaucasus region, which may not mean anything to you or your viewers again. So it's sort of wedged between Russia and Iran, if you look horizontally. And this way, it's wedged between Turkey and sort of Azerbaijan and Central Asia. So it's essentially this meeting place between Central Asia, the Middle East, the Southern Russian plateaus, and Anatolia and Eastern Europe. So it's, it's a place where multiple sort of cultures and geographic regions meet. Uh, up until the early 1990s, it was part of the Soviet Union. It was one of the 16 republics, which has affected its winemaking. And we'll talk about that later on. Uh, but now it's an independent country. It's, I think, roughly 30,000 square kilometers or so. So maybe slightly larger than Massachusetts, something like that. It's relatively it's small. And it's heavily mountainous, so it's it's primarily uh, uh, high elevation. So I think the lowest elevations in Armenia are about six or seven hundred meters above sea level. So it's landlocked. There is no sea, and so uh, the lowest point in Armenia is higher than, you know, the highest point in some other countries. So it's a it's a mountainous country. And it has everything from sort of subalpine, very green, lush mountains to semi-desert, arid, very dry mountains also. So there's, there's a lot of uh, variety in the sort of the soil, the terroir, and the climate, even though it's a tiny place. Okay. And how many uh, 
like what's the population there? Is it more of a spread out population or is there pockets of density, dense population there? No, it, it's sparsely populated. It's roughly two and a half to three million people live there. So it's very small. And the capital itself is home to approximately a million of those. So, so the majority, you know, about a third to a half of the population lives in the capital and the surrounding suburbs. And the rest of the country is sort of mountainous and uh, very rural. It's, it's not densely populated. Okay. And we just have Catherine Bolando who joined Hi. us. Hi. So um, we cannot see you. I don't know if you want your camera on or off, but I can hear you, but we can't see oh. you. I am. Um, <laughs> this go. is me. I'm, I'm in Penn Station oh. heading to my parents' house. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, I'm happy to have the camera on. I just turned it off because I'm like this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, well, nice sorry. to meet you. Yes, and, you too. Do you want to do a, while you're on camera, do you want to do a little brief introduction of, of who you are and your relation to these wines and Storica wines? Yeah, of course. Um, I am Storica's head of marketing, and I've been with the company since September. Um, I have like over 10 years of marketing and digital marketing experience and some publishing experience um kind of mainly in like the health and wellness but consumer goods space um sorry so i have i'm just gonna wait <laughs> sorry Okay. Um, sorry. And in my time, um, I've done a lot of like uh, revitalization of like their website and their content and their social media. And what I do for the company is um, all of their digital marketing efforts. So all of the PR outreach, all of the content you see on our social media, um, any of the virtual events that are happening. Um, I help support the sales team with uh both materials, but also like kind of helping promote the stores or the restaurants where the products are sold um, and help manage everything with the website. So from like the launch of the direct to consumer platform to any of the, the advertising that we do um, and so on. So my relation to the wines is actually, I, I did not have much experience in the wine world prior to Storica, let alone Armenian wine. So um I think even like in conversations such as this, like I love to listen in because I think Ada does such a great job like explaining both the region, but the history of everything. And um, so anyway, so like I kind of try to take the knowledge of the brand and, and really try to share and introduce it with people such as yourself um, to get people excited about this region. Awesome. Well, yeah. Ara just was telling us a little bit about the Armenia as itself. And now I just want to talk about the history because I was blown away to find that like wine was being made here 6,100 years ago. And they've actually found like the oldest winery in, you know, when they were, I guess, excavating or something. So Ara, if you can fill us in on a little bit of, of the, the history of Armenia and then wine history in Armenia. Sure, yes. So, uh, you know, Armenia, as you mentioned, the oldest winery in the world is a cave that was excavated by archaeologists about, from about 6,100 years ago or so. Uh, but, you know, we believe that that was a sort of ceremonial winemaking cave. It's not as if they were making wine and selling it in the village or anything like that. It was used in rituals and things like that. But that 6,100 years ago is before the Bronze Age, and it's a really, really long time ago. Um, Armenia itself, uh, you know, has existed uh, not since 6,000 years ago, more like 4,000 years ago. The creation of the Armenian nation is related to the ancient kingdom of Urartu, which was in that region. So Armenians have their own language, have their own uh, alphabet, right? They're a Christian nation as of the year 101. Uh, prior to that, they were sort of living and coexisting with people like the Roman Empire and the Greeks, you know, things like that. Uh, the earliest sort of 
past the 6,000 years ago, if we skip to, you know, the first millennium BC, there are historical records of um, Greek armies marching through the land that is known as Armenia and commenting in their history books and their travelogues about how there was this fermented wheat product, fermented barley, which, which is kind of beer, and fermented grape juice, which they were fascinated with. So there are lots of records of the armies, the soldiers being paid in wine in Armenia, but also various Armenian regions paying taxes and doing trade and using wine as a sort of commodity, as almost money to pay for things, right? And even prior to that, there were records of Babylonians purchasing wine from Armenia in these large wooden casks, putting them on boats and sending them down the river to Babylonia. Uh, so, so it does go back quite a long way, and many of the grape varieties actually go back that far also. So some of the grape varieties that we're going to taste and talk about today are actually the ones that I believe were there, you know, thousands of years ago, uh, based on DNA analysis. There's proof that uh, these grapes were there and they were being cultivated, which is amazing when you really think about it. They've survived so fast all this forward, time, right? They've survived all this exactly. time. Exactly, exactly. And many of these grapes are not found anywhere else. And, you know, ampelographers and sort of genealogists, perhaps, have failed to find cousin grapes in other places. So many of them are just sort of unique to Armenia, possibly because it's it was sort of always mountainous and cut off from the rest of the world. And so maybe there wasn't much migration in terms of Grape vines, uh, but we don't know. So maybe time will prove that there's a cousin in France or Italy. Who knows? God forbid the French they have to admit they bought vines from Armenia one day. But it may happen, right? Uh, yeah. And so if we fast forward to about a hundred years ago when the Soviet Union was formed, after World War One, the land that used to be Armenia, you know, to say it very quickly, was sort of divided up. Part of it became a uh, uh, a Soviet Republic, and it was in fact the smallest of the 16 Soviet Republics. So as such, the Armenian economy was run by the Soviet Union, and they decided that Armenia would produce brandy instead of wine, and that Georgia would produce wine. This is what people sitting in Moscow smoking cigars decided, apparently. And so the, the grapes that used to be uh, cultivated for wine slowly went out of fashion and the Soviets planted grapes that were sort of higher yielding and made more neutral tasting wines because that's what you want when you're going to distill it and turn it into brandy of some sort, right? So many of the old varieties were sort of left off to the side, even though there were pockets of people who kept cultivating these, but overall the vast majority of the wine that was made there was either cheap wine or it was uh, in distilled later into brandy. Uh, so when the Soviet Union collapsed, Armenia in general, you know, once it became independent, uh, just like many other Soviet republics, they started to sort of realize, well, wait, we had our own traditions before we became part of the Soviet Union. And of course, people, you know, tried to rediscover their cuisine before it was sort of influenced by perhaps Russian cuisine. Uh, also their language and sort of what they wear and all these things. And part of that, of course, is wine. So when it came to wines and grapes, uh, post-independence, Armenians started to rediscover what their original grape vines were and what the grape varieties were. And they discovered hillsides and terroirs where there were all these old vines that were just left desolate. No one was taking care of them. Or the people that were taking care of them were sort of using uh, Soviet methodology to not, to, to not yield quality grapes out of them because they were trying to get more yield perhaps out of them. In any case, to summarize, it was a, it's a journey of rediscovery that's happening there. And the younger generation of winemakers is sort of trying to re-educate themselves on how to grow these old grape varieties, how to vinify them, and eventually to market them and sell them, right? Yeah. So, so that's the sort of journey of rediscovery that we are trying to help with at Storica. We're trying to tell that story that, hey, there are these hundreds of grape varieties that the world does not know about, that Armenians are rediscovering over the past 20, 25 years since gaining independence, and that some of these are ancient, 
and the wines are delicious. So that's kind of the project that we have embarked on is to tell that story. So there's so there's so many countries that um, their wine, like Portugal, for example, the the wine production is so tied into the ebbs and flows of their political, you know, ups and downs. Um, is Armenia kind of in that same realm, or like when they were free, they've stayed free? Like you know, historically, have have their it's not ownership, but <laughs> changed throughout multiple times, or have they pretty much held to their own? Other than well, so yeah, no, well, it has, yeah, it has changed because you know there were mm, throughout history times when Armenia was invaded or controlled by Islamic empires, right? Who basically forbid alcohol, obviously. So, so there were long periods of time where it would have been forbidden. I mean, this is many hundreds of years ago. I wasn't there, but, but in theory, you know, the tradition of drinking wine would have been lost for a phase, probably, even though people probably still did it at home, but as a sort of national economy and as something that people pursue on a daily basis, it would not have been allowed for many, many years during those times. And part of Armenia ended up in the Ottoman Empire, which was also Islamic in nature. So so there were many historical facts that sort of took winemaking and the tradition of wine drinking also away from Armenia. So, so what has sort of, due to historical events, the Armenia we have today is part of the historic Armenia, and the part that remains as an independent country today has remained independent because it has been in sort of, if you will, in the Russian orbit. And so for political reasons, uh, it's been part of the Russian Empire and then the Soviet Union. So slowly the Russian tradition of drinking distillates replaced the tradition of drinking wines in Armenia. So it's only in the last 30 years or so that people are learning to drink wine with dinner and to drink wine when you go out. Whereas before, wine was just sort of, you only had a glass just to toast, and then you went back to your brandy or your vodka. Okay. So now people are rediscovering the sort of the social aspect of wine, the sort of trivial aspect of wine, and the fact that it relates to cuisine, right? right. So it'll probably take yet another generation to make that complete re-transformation. But it's definitely happening. The consumption of distillates is going down slowly and the consumption of wine is going up. And so I think maybe in 20 years, um, they will have sort of completed a cycle of rediscovering how to use wine in daily life, which is beautiful. And not to, not to make it sound bad, but typically <laughs> Russian areas that have been controlled by Russia always, always quality, uh, I'm sorry, quantity, quantity, quantity. And so when an area, a country becomes out from under the Russian umbrella, they're starting off with that mentality of, I've got to stop this quantity and I want to move to quality. So the winemakers need to start working in changing that direction. So how have the winemakers, what are their focus in on as these you know, a couple of decades have gone through to improve their quality. Right. So, so a lot of it has been about knowing what grape varieties to plant and which ones to give up and uproot, right? But also whether to plant in the fields or on the hillsides and this sort of thing. Obviously, in the Soviet Union, the majority of the commercial winemaking was on flat lands because it was done with tractors. It was done not for quality, as you said for quantity. So part of it is rediscovering where to plant and where to cultivate. And part of it is about the var varieties themselves and understanding which variety goes best in which aspect and which elevation and in which kind of soil, right? Uh, and the other part of it is technology. So part of what happened when Armenia became independent was Armenia is a relatively unique country in that at least as many, if not more actually, people of Armenian descent live outside of Armenia than within it. And that's the case today also. Uh, there may be other countries that are like that. I can't think of any, but there may be some. Um, so what that meant was after independence, many people of Armenian descent who had lived elsewhere slowly started to come back and sort of 
understand, visit their homeland, so to speak, the homeland of their grandparents or something like that. Many of them had never even been there before, nor had their parents. And so with that sort of repatriation came sort of some knowledge. So we had people who were who worked in the wine trade in Italy, in the US, in France, perhaps in England, who came and brought some knowledge. Also people who were more winemakers came and invested money and introduced, you know, temperature controlled fermentations and things like this. So Armenia, unlike neighboring Georgia, is very sort of easily persuaded to borrow knowledge. So Armenians kind of are proud to say, oh, we have an Italian guy helping us to make wine. Whereas my Georgian friends usually would aim to say that because they would say, what do Italians know? We know how to make wine. So, so it's interesting how different the two countries are, even though they're both very similar. They're both small and they're both right next to one another. And they both have a long and rich history of winemaking. But in the past 30 years, Armenians have really borrowed, whether it's, you know, equipment, like steel tanks and barrels and things like that, or vinification knowledge, or just hiring consultants, um, they're really sort of using the ancient varieties and the ancient terroirs, and they're adding modern knowledge and modern technology. And that's what's yielding this very interesting high-quality wine at a relatively low price. And now you had mentioned that, you know, it's very mountainous and it's landlocked. So we're not really getting, there's no ocean influence. There's no that. So how, what is the, what is the climate the like in Armenia? Like what are the grapes enjoying growing in? So it would be described as deeply uh, continental meaning very cold winters and very hot summers, right? And most of the rain would be in the fall and in the winter. Um, what Armenia enjoys in terms of viticulture is uh, intense sunlight because of the high elevation, right? Uh, it has uh, volcanic soils often uh, on top of limestone, right? So, so a couple of, many of the larger mountains that are in or next to Armenia are ancient volcanoes that are that have already erupted and they're no longer active. So obviously after eruptions, after the lava, you know, millions of years of sort of disintegration, you end up with this crumbly volcanic soil. And that's what typifies a lot of the soil in the winemaking regions. Uh, and Armenia enjoys super dry uh, climate. So, so they don't have to fight fungal disease and things like that as much, except in a couple of regions. But for the most part, we're uh, grape growing takes place. Uh, the climate is very dry. It's arid. And so, you know, and the wind keeps all the humidity away. So, so the grapes grow healthily with very little need to sort of spray chemicals and things like that to, to fight the fungus. So a lot of the grape growing can be done in a sort of sustainable, environmentally friendly manner. So are they dry farming or is there irrigation? For the most part, there is some places to irrigate, but for the most part, it's dry farming. And honestly, they haven't come nearly far enough to have Appalachian regulations in terms of uh, irrigation and things like that. I think people are talking about things like that, but I'm not sure when they'll get to it. So, so if you want to irrigate, you can irrigate. The problem is where do you get the water and how do you get it to your, how do you pipe it all the way there and that sort of thing. I mean, many of these vineyards you have to park the car somewhere and walk up the hillside to get to the vineyard. So, so it's kind of like if you can imagine some of those uh, Argentinian desolate mountains where they where they grow grapes. Uh, very crazy stuff. Sometimes you have to walk a half hour from your car to get to the vineyard, right? So this is that sort of uh, scenery we're talking about. It's not like there's a paved road and the gate opens and you get to the winery. And so it's really sort of rugged mountain territory. And what about, do are they concerned with those cold winters? Are the vines susceptible to frost? Are they adapted to yes. that? Yes. Yeah, so so in some spots, they do bury the vines. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, but that's that's in places where, where obviously you have some flat land so that the cold air, you know, descends downward and sits on the ground. But a lot of the higher quality regions that are on sort of on slopes and higher elevation, 
they obviously then don't, don't have that issue because the, the the frost just sort of slides down the mountainside onto the valley, right? And so the grapes themselves have been there so long that they've adapted. And so the red wine, for example, we're going to drink made with the Arini grape has very thick skins and seems to withstand those freezing temperatures without any help. Okay, cool. And now, so that was a good intro because I read that there are uh, 30 uh, native grape varieties in Armenia. So what... Um, that's a lot of indigenous grapes, you know, uh, you know, usually there's like a few, you know. Um, so tell us about the the most common ones I are the uh, what you just said, Arene? Did I say it? Yes. Okay, Arene, which is the red. And then this one, no way am I pronouncing this one correctly. So if I get this right, I'm going to I'm going to see me jump for joy. Um, Knagni. <laughs> Not even close. To... Uh, K H N D O G H N I. Oh, Chandorni. Yes. Yeah. So the, the transliteration isn't. It doesn't make much sense. That's not you. That's sort of all those syllables next to one another. You know? <laughs> it's in English, so so it's not you. Yes, Chandorni. It's also known as. This is another way in which Armenians are quick to adapt. So so they've come up with another name for it that's much easier for people to pronounce called Sireni. Sireni. Okay, I like that yes, one better. So that's, that's, exactly. <laughs> so they've just decided to change the name of the grape because people that are trying to sell it to keep complaining that they can't pronounce it. And okay. they're just saying, okay, fine, we'll change the name. We'll change the name. But you know, I think that's a very valid point. You know, there's been research about why certain wine, grape varieties, you know, especially like think German grape variety, you know, a lot of the wines don't sell well because people can't pronounce them. And, you know, the the international grapes, you know, the Cabernet Sauvignon, the, you know, the Merlot, all of these are easy to pronounce. So I think they've got something going that they might, <laughs> it might be. They might change all the names. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's also another red. Um, and then the Vashkaha is a white, correct? That's the leading white grape, yes. Leading uh, white grape. The, the, the word Vosky means golden. And hot uh, berry, so it's referred to as the golden, golden berry uh, sort of grape. Yeah, there are actually many more than 30 grape varieties. Okay. Hundreds, uh, but maybe the 30 are sort of more commercially used. Maybe that's where the number came from. There are actually okay. dozens and dozens more. But as I've said, the tradition of cultivating them has almost been lost. So the new generation is now one by one, plot by plot, trying to plant commercially these varieties that only exist, sometimes they only exist in derelict monasteries on the mountainsides, where hundreds of years ago people planted some grapes and then the monastery was maybe left untended. And so if you go there, you'll see grape vines just like covering this old monastery, the whole building. The vines are very, very old. So they take cuttings sometimes from those old vines and try to commercially grow them in a commercial vineyard. So We'll see what happens with all those grape varieties. It's very interesting to see what they all taste like when you cultivate them commercially. Right. And how about the genetics of them, the DNA? Do we do do they know if they've given rise to offspring or what their parents are of of like the the RNA? Like, do they know where it came from? Uh, the Arani, no. Arani is very, very old. So, so far, even some of the leading people in the world who deal with these things have not been able to identify any relatives. Okay. That's not to say that tomorrow someone won't find it, but so far they've been unable to find any relatives anywhere. Uh, so as far as the indigenous varieties, uh, it's very difficult. They're just starting the process now, and apparently it's going to take you know decades okay. to get to the point where they can, the science can be where it is for them to be able to, to identify it. But having said that, I'm really not a, not an expert in the genetics of grapevines, but from what I've read, uh, so far, anytime they've tried, they've sort of not found any other uh, relatives. But there are grape varieties that were sort of, you know, crossed during the Soviet years, so they would take two indigenous varieties with different traits, and they wanted to combine the traits, so they would do that during the Soviet years. 
So there are many grapevines that are commercially grown today that make very nice wine that didn't exist 100 years ago, that they're, they're crosses of two other indigenous grapes. So, so we do have those. Those were made by sort of Russians, and they're, they're, they're often named after some Soviet war or something <laughs> like that. Sort of funny. But, but they're still delicious. And how many wineries would you say, commercial wineries, would you say are in Armenia right now? It seems to be, you know, increasing every day, to be honest. Uh, the last time I checked, there were somewhere between 60 and 80, some very, very tiny, some quite large who, you know, make millions of bottles. Uh, but most of them are small. But because of this sort of, renaissance that's happening, more and more people are starting, you know, either vineyards or, or wineries, both. Uh, so the number keeps changing, and I wouldn't be surprised if in five years they got up to 100, because it's sort of a fashionable thing now. Uh, land is still relatively cheap compared to, say, Italy or France. Uh, for, so people buy a plot of land and hire someone to come in and the vineyard and hire a winemaker to make the wine. So... Yeah, so so it's growing. It's very dynamic, uh, and younger and younger people and people with investments from abroad are coming back, hiring consultants and starting wineries. So but right now, I would say about seventy. And the majority of them are family run, like exactly. The majority of them are relatively small and and family run. Exactly. Yeah, and many of them are run with sort of you know bank loans and things like this. Uh, there are only less than five very large wineries. And are they, because they're all going through, you know, you think of situations, that, you know, here when people go through something that are similar, uh, they start to band together. Like when we built our home, everybody who built in that development, our little community, right, we were going through the same things, the same problems, seeing the same things together. So are they banding together to, to try to help each other and learn from each other? Do they work together or are they pretty much individualized wineries that are learning as they go? I think, uh, I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, for the most part, everyone's taking their own course. Uh, but they they are sort of, you know, the cooperative winery model, because Armenia was a Soviet country, that word doesn't resonate very well in Eastern Europe and in the Soviet Union. People don't like returning back to this idea of collectivism and all this mm -hmm. stuff because they had uh, not such a great mm -hmm. outcome from it for about 100 years, whereas in Europe and, and in the U.S., for us, it's a beautiful thing. It's cost savings and it's sort of unity and that sort of thing. But people don't seem to like the cooperative sort of model right now. That That's also true of all pretty much all ex-Soviet republics. They're not crazy about that idea. So for the most part, they're all independent, but they do help one another. Sometimes they band together and export together through the same uh, company. Uh, and there is something called the Wine and Fine Foundation, which is funded by the government with outside support that helps sort of with communications and putting people in touch with one another and helps gather information from all the wineries to facilitate exports and to open markets and things like that. But the wineries themselves, uh, for the most part, operate independently. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's start with the first uh, wine. Uh, winery I have is um, Kush, and it is sparkling. So I love sparkling. You can never have too many bubbles, in my opinion. So, Try it. <laughs> this is Origins, and it's a Brute, and it is uh, made in the traditional method. So can you tell us a little bit about the, um, the and this is also made with the uh, Vashika, right? Roskehat, as yeah. well as uh, Katuni, which is another. Katuni. Okay. So t can you give us a little bit background on those two grapes? Um, and how the blend, and a little bit about Kush. Am I saying it right? Is that how you say it is Kush? Yes, yes. Okay. Everyone seems to say it their own way, which is what the beauty of it is. <laughs> so Kush is short for the winemaker's name is Kush Geryon. Oh. That's his last And so that's the first syllable of his last name. So they've named the, the brand after their last name, which is great. Uh, so this is a brand that, that makes traditional method bottle fermented uh, wines. Uh, this comes from a super high elevation site, about 1,600 meters high, 
in a relatively remote area where there are, I think they're the only vineyard in this part of Armenia. Um, and they grow uh, Voskehad and Khatuni. Voskehad is the leading white grape of Armenia, which is what the other still wine is made with. Khatuni is a rare variety, uh, but, but, but it kind of complements Voskehad in this sort of blend. So the wine is made with a consultant from, I believe, Champagne, uh, who helps them with the bottle fermentation technology and knowledge. Uh, so the, the lees aging, the bottle fermentation takes approximately 18 to 22 months, depending on the disgorgement. Some disgorgements happen about 18 months. Some happen later, almost two years later. Uh, partially, they say, because they can't even disgorge that many bottles at once to be consistent. Um, but but it's generally in that uh, in that window. And as I'm sure you know, something like uh, non-vintage champagne only has to be, you know, about 15 to 18 months, 15 months on the lease, 18 months total in the bottle. So this regular brute already spends more than the minimum required for all non-vintage champagne. So, so it starts to get into that autolytic sort of uh, area of those baked bread aromas. Uh, and, but it just still retains its freshness because it's disgorged just before those aromas get even more prominent, right? So it's, you've got the combination of richness and toastiness from the autolysis, but you also have the freshness because it, it, the autolysis didn't go on for too long. So the wine's really sort of driven by this super crisp acidity, a lot of uh, almond notes, a lot of green apple notes and some citrus notes. Uh, but it has that sort of background of toasty, autolytic, yeasty, and uh, baked bread type of aromas. So it pretty much drinks like an entry-level champagne or a super high-end cava or something. Like that. Do you know what the suggested retail is here? Yes, it's somewhere between 20 and $22. Okay. So uh, very, very affordable to have bubbles. Very that's, affordable that's, for, that's yeah, for 18 to 22 method. months. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And now this is a this is a brute. Um, they have a blanc de blanc, and then I read that they're actually going to be coming out with a blanc de noir soon, also, right? There's a blanc de noir, and there's a rosé, of course, which is the most popular one, I believe. Uh, we will hopefully have the rosé here next fall. Uh, they're just talking about disgorging those now, and the rosé is made with the Arani grape, okay. the red going to have in the still wine yes so so the blanc de noir and the and the rosé will be a bit more expensive than this they will retail in the mid 30s but those are you know the blanc de noir and the blanc de blanc are aged three years on the lease which is like vintage champagne mm -hmm. right so they're much richer and much more oxidative you get more of the baked apple aromas rather than the green apple aromas uh, and you get a lot more creaminess and autolysis, obviously, and they're a bit more relaxed. This one's still very frothy and very energetic, whereas the other ones tend to be a little bit more mature and they taste a little you know, uh, sort of more subdued, if you will. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And now the next winery we have is uh, Zulal, and I love the fact that it is Armenian for pure so that is a great name so can you tell us a little bit about this winery yeah so zulal actually is a sort of uh, they purchase their grapes from roughly 40 to 50 families of grape growers so it's not an estate winery it's a label that believes in sort of growing indigenous varieties and supporting the families that have fields that are growing indigenous varieties and as such they contract with them longer term so to grow these grapes, obviously help them monitor the quality of the grapes and that sort of thing. Uh, and they, all the grapes are uh, hand harvested and trucked to the winery, which is closer to the city. And at that point, they basically vinify them with more or less minimal intervention. They put them in stainless steel tanks so that there's no sort of intrusion from from oak barrels or things like that, or amphora, which is also traditional there. Uh, so their aim is to showcase the aromas of each indigenous variety. So 
for the, for most of their volume is the Arani red and the Voskehat white, but they also have a small line of boutique uh, uh, labels where they make anywhere between a thousand to three thousand bottles only of all these other indigenous varieties that are tiny, tiny micro productions, right? That's pretty cool. That they, so that yeah. they're they're actually could be like as they continue that they could be like the living history of this. Exactly, of, of all grapes. these grapes. Exactly, yeah. It'll be like an encyclopedia of these catalogs. Yeah, there are others doing things like this too, but uh, this one's run by Mr. Goshkirian's daughter Amy. So we're proud to be showcasing a sort of woman-run project, which is beautiful, right? Especially in that part of the world where it may not always be that easy to be honest uh but we want to be supportive and we think it's important for you know women in that part of the world to do as they please why not okay. uh, so we're very happy to support her and her endeavors and she's just getting started by the way this is only this is a two-year-old project or maybe three by now so this is still in its infancy and we hope that she will continue to grow and sort of expand the number of varieties that they've been by and find markets for them. It's wonderful. Awesome. And now if somebody is is picking up a glass of Vashke Hat, what can they expect? So um, aromatics wise on the palate, what can they expect to taste? So so Vosque Hat is sort of uh, in terms of aroma, it's mildly aromatic. It's not a super aromatic grape, nor is it sort of neutral smelling. Um, so Often it has apple and pear type of aromas. Okay. It lives in this kind of, some people think it smells like Chenin Blanc maybe a little bit with that deep pear note. It also often has notes of uh, green herbs uh, on the nose, like maybe tarragon or oregano, something like that, right? And white flowers. So, so it's a little floral, a little herbal, but in terms of fruit, it's sort of ripe apple and pear. Uh, in warmer vintages, I'm told, and I don't have, you know, much experience with lots of vintages with Voskehat, but apparently in warmer vintages, it gets into more of the tropical fruit aromas like mango and pineapple and things like that. Uh, but for the most part, it lives in that middle sort of range of, of, of pear to melon. Yeah. Now, the palate, it's sort of, a lot of people describe it as having the weight of a Chardonnay. So the aroma along with the weight of a Chardonnay. So it's, you know, it's weighty, uh, and but it's sort of uh, really supported by acidity. And so it doesn't get as fat as Chardonnay on the palate, but it has the weight of Chardonnay, but it comes across as more sort of refreshing, uh, partially at least because of the high elevation and the nights that we get at high elevations. So overall, it's sort of... Uh, it, it, it's mildly fruity and it's more sort of floral and and herbal. It goes very well with, we tried it with, uh, uh, not clams, but the... Uh, Oysters? No, the, uh, the one you cook for two minutes. Uh, uh, scallop? A scallop? Scallop, yeah. Oh, it does very scallop. well with scallop oh, okay. or, or white meat chicken, that kind of not too chewy and not too soft kind of texture. Uh, it also does very well with vegetables, with those green notes. So with a salad, or with a fish that has sort of herbs on it or a pesto of some sort, it does yeah. very well like that. Uh, I like it with sort of feta cheese and herbs. If you're having some green, fresh yeah. herbs with cheese, with bread and cucumber, that sort of light summertime snack. It's delicious with things like that too. And it's traditionally also had with fish. So it sounds like it may actually be one of uh, a grape varietal that... Uh, is a good wine to pair with some of those uh, more difficult to pair foods, such as like a vinaigrette. Even uh, asparagus and stuff like yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, and everybody's so always well looking with... for a wine that can pair with those. <laughs> that's right, that's right, with green tasting things, yeah. Right, right. Yep, that's uh, well. And then the last wine, um, the last okay. one I have is the Zulal Ereni. And it, this is the reserve, and this one I actually have in my glass. So, um, oh, Catherine, can you just mute yourself, please? Oh, I'm sorry. I, that's what I thought I. <laughs> uh, so this is the Arene Reserve, okay? And 
Um, this specifically says, and I'm going to pronounce it wrong, Vyots uh, Zor. Perfect. Hey. Okay. So can you tell us a little bit about where that is, where that, that region is, and what's special about it um, that they're putting it on there? Right. So Vyots Zor is, is, has fast become the, the sort of leading uh, wine region in Armenia. It's where this ancient cave is from 6,100 years ago, it's in this region. Uh, there's also a, the central town there is also called Areni. So many people think that maybe the grape originates there. I mean, I don't know if it's been proven or not, but it's sort of where the town Areni is, where the 6,100-year-old cave is, where a lot of vineyards are. So it's kind of like the the Napa Valley of Armenia without the circus of Napa Valley, if you will. <laughs> sort of Napa Valley 100 years ago, maybe, or something like that. Um, so it's the leading region. It's very high elevation, and this region is is deeply volcanic in soil, and uh, you know it's a region that's characterized by a lot of sort of changes in topography. So it's not a flat region. There are a lot of crevices in the mountains and things like this. So a lot of uh, varying uh, mountain sides and sort of uh, a lot of slopes. So there are probably, you know, 15 or 20 of the 60 or so wineries are in this region. So it's fairly significant in terms of its, um, that's where many of the wine tourists end up going is this region. Okay. So this is, I I finally ha get to drink. So this is good. Um, <laughs> so I didn't know, um, I was trying to look up the the grape itself and I wasn't really sure about whether it was a, uh, tannic structure, what the tannic structure of the wine was. So I actually did Coravin it about two hours ago to let it get some air. But can you tell us a little bit about the grape itself? Like, how does it grow? Is it, is it you know, um, thick skin, thin skinned? When do they typically harvest? Right. Yeah, so this is Areni. Areni uh, develops a thick skin and throughout the centuries being sort of exposed to the harsh cold winters, and the hot summer sun and the wind and all these things, it has adapted. So it has a relatively thick skin, even though uh, it doesn't have much tannin and, and pigment, as you can see, it's not an opaque wine. You can see yeah. through it, uh, but it has a thick skin that really sort of, uh, there you go, that protects it from the, from the harsh elements, right? Uh, it, from what I know, it grows relatively easily, right? It's not prone to much disease in that region because, as we said, there isn't much fungal disease anyway. Um, this one comes from a south-facing sort of uh, large plot. So the grapes that go into the reserve, as opposed to the regular irony that Zulal makes, are sort of carefully selected. They're a bit riper, and they, they come from a much smaller selection of vineyards, whereas the regular irony comes from... Uh, all over the uh, that area. So they vinify this in stainless steel, okay. and then they put it in barrels that are uh, three or 400 uh, liter barrels uh, that are maybe fourth or fifth year use. Okay. So these are not neutral. new barrels. Neutral. Exactly. They're, they're pretty much neutral. They're putting them in the barrels not to get aroma or flavor or even texture out of them, but to just let the wine really slowly relax over a period of a year and a half or so. Uh, and that's where you get a lot of these sort of forest floor and earthy elements, I think, in, in this way. So I'm getting, like, it's very, um, it is, I think it's somewhat aromatic. It's not pronounced, but when you put it up to your nose, it's it's there. Right. Um, it's get, I have, it's red berries, but then I also get kind of like a gaminess and spiciness to it um, That that is pretty... Yeah pretty big that's typical of this variety yeah so this variety typically is uh characterized by this kind of plum and mulberry fruit and a lot of peppery spice a black pepper type of spice not green pepper uh, that's a little bit accentuated maybe with the oak aging it's even spicier you get these earthier uh woody leafy foresty notes from the from the barrel aging also it's lighter body than i had expected mm-hmm um, I mean, the color, the color, you, like you said, you can see through it. I can see my fingers through it. So like for people who are listening, it's kind of Pinot-esque in terms of, you know, 
trick being able to see it and and the color it's it's kind of it you can see it's got translucent edges and stuff but um i don't know i was expecting it to be a medium body of wine um well actually yes before i poured it from what i was reading about the grape and all of that just because of the thick skins and that i was expecting um uh not quite uh Petite Syrah, somewhere between Cab Sauve and, you know, Petite Syrah. That's where, you know, um, yeah. that's where Even I though the great skins themselves are thick, somehow, you know, there isn't that much pigment and there isn't that much tannin in the wine either. No. It's there, but it's, it's just barely noticeable. Yeah, the tannin is there for structure, but it's not, it's, it's not. It's not what I was thinking it was going to be. I was thinking it was going to be a big, bold, you know, kind of in your face wine. And it's, it's, it's elegant. You know, it's. Yes, it's more subtle. It's, it's more subtle and elegant than, than big and brash. Absolutely. Arnie typically makes wines that are kind of, you know, if, if you had to kind of, if you were making your own blend of maybe Sangiovese, Sangiovese, Merlot, you know, Noir, Zinfandel, maybe what you would end up with, right? All those wines that are kind of in that medium space. Right. And the, the, it's got a pretty decent level of acid in there. It's, it's, you know, it's a nice level of acid. Right. And it, the, the tannin you get on the end, but not out of control tannin. It's, it's the tannin that just lets the wine sit on your palate longer. So, I mean, it's still going. My the finish is still going. So it's an extremely it helps long finish. echo the aromas in your mouth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tannins aromas forward. Yeah, yeah. So it's typically yeah that acidity is also typical, partially because of the grape variety, but partially also due to the you know the growing uh, conditions with the high elevation and the cold nights and all that. Uh, so it's a very good food wine because it is sort of elegant. There's depth of flavor, but 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 it's not overpowering. Uh, and the body isn't very heavy. So this is typically had with, you know, with a serious meal or a relatively heavy meal. You can have this with uh, the acidity serves as a palate cleanser. If you're having a, a stew or a barbecue or, you know, something sort of deeply flavored. Uh, but it's light enough to have with, with, like, with a sandwich too, because it doesn't really overpower simpler foods. It's relatively medium body. Yeah, the, um, the, the, pepper the spice in it um will go well with you know on the heavier end of a food product you know a food uh, meal but because the body structure uh, you know the body you know the lighter body of it and everything can go with lighter meals also so it's really a, a versatile grape a, a bottle that you can you can sit down with a whole bunch of different meals with it yeah, it can do everything from, you know, three-year-old aged cheese at the end of a meal mm -hmm. to, to the main course, or it could be with, with, with lighter snacks. Absolutely, yeah. I think it is versatile. Yeah, and it's it's not so overpowering that when the meal is over, if if you haven't finished the bottle yet, which is rare, um, but if you haven't finished the bottle, you can just enjoy it on its own after, you know, as you're, you know, settling down after the meal. Um it's a beautiful wine. It really is. And and what does this retail for? It retails for about $30. How many? 30 Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. The, you cut off, and I knew what you said was not. Because it, it was not, yeah. <laughs> but I said three. Three. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait a second. <laughs> bring, bring on the cases. <laughs> oh, yes. I'll buy two cases. <laughs> But still, at thirty dollars, it's it is it's a lovely wine, it, and it's a like I said, a kind of a chameleon with what you're going to be able to pair with it. So it's a nice wine to have in your cellar because you're not you know pigeonholed into a specific meal. So. Exactly, versatile. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it'll last. Sometimes you know I taste it three days after opening it, and it's still you know firing on all cylinders. And that was going to actually going to be, this is probably a very difficult question to answer with how short Armenian wine history is for the quality, but where are they predicting, you know, the, how long can you sell her this wine for? Are they producing this to be drunk now or are they producing in goals of, yeah, this can sell her for, 
for a few years. Yeah, so as you said, it's difficult because we obviously have a lot of examples from you know 15 years ago because they were just starting uh, back then. The very few wines that have some history show that they can be aged. This wine they're making to be enjoyed within probably five to six years, I would imagine. Yeah, it might get a little more bottle aroma, but you know they make another wine called Oshin, which which is made to be drunk in the seven to ten year range. Uh, that's when it'll hit. Maturity, that one has more tannin and just more structure overall. Uh, but that's a much smaller production wine. They only make 5,000 bottles a year or something like that. So that, so they are aiming for uh, consumers who do want to sell it and open it in six to ten years. Uh, but that's a different wine than this. This one's probably, this one's tasting well now. I, mm-hmm. It'll probably taste slightly more interesting in a year or two. Mm-hmm. And it'll probably go another three to four years. Yeah. Right. And this is a 2018. So, yeah. It, uh, yeah, I can see. I mean, it's enjoyable now, but I think that it does have, it's got some legs on it that can can relax in your cellar for a while. It's already three years old. So maybe yeah. four years, do you think? Yeah. Yeah. I would, I, I would say like 2025 would be. Right. Yeah. So. It's it's beautiful. Uh, the aromas are really very nice. Um, and let's get together, twenty twenty five. Let's put it on our calendar. All right, you. I'll a save date. a couple of these bottles and <laughs> you go open them again. It's a day. I'm not gonna lie. That's not that bottle's not gonna last till twenty twenty five. So <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll save one for you. Don't worry. All right, about. awesome, awesome. So can um can you tell us where do these wineries are they on social media themselves? Uh, how do people find these wines? How do they find them on social media? How do they find you on social media? Yeah, so while some of the wineries, you know, have their own social media pages, in the U.S., uh, Storica, we sort of manage that. So the best way to find the wines and learn about them is to go to storicawines.com, where you can sort of put in your zip code and see where you can find the wine closest to you. We also have a DTC site, direct to consumer where you can go, there's a link on the page, you can go there and purchase the wine to be delivered to your home. I believe, you know, 35 or 37 of the states we can deliver to. Some of them we can't yet, but hopefully we will be able to soon. Uh, That's another way to do it. But also social media, just search for Storica Wines. And we feature these brands as well as others uh, on our social media pages. Catherine manages all that, so she may be able to add some information that I missed, but basically you can find it through Storica. Yeah. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> Anything you um, want to add, Catherine? No, I think you pretty much summed it up pretty well. I did want to add a little caveat about the ocean wines. Um, we actually do carry those and they're on a wait list on our website. So I don't want to have this interrupt me, but I'll let out a cop talk. The announcer is going to start talking. Okay. Um, oh, never mind. But, um, but yes, yeah, so if we do have those wines, um, soon we'll be carrying them and they, we do have a wait list. And I think I had mentioned to you, and I don't know, Ada, did you talk about the rosé that we're producing and, and importing? So that's on its way to the States as well. So we're getting prepared to launch that this summer and um, really try to use the marketing platforms as a way to reach several different types of audiences, both like the onophile community of like, you know, they, they look to read the ratings and the reviews and really like understand like the history of it, um, which is a really exciting like space for us um, to get exposure in, but then also targeting the Armenian population in the States who are just extremely passionate and supportive and happy to see, you know, products from their region coming here, both giving back to their region, but, you know, making it a celebrated place and, um, discovered space because I feel like a lot of people don't even know much about Armenia. But and then lastly, it's also we're targeting, you know, not necessarily the millennial, but the maybe younger crowd or the crowd that's like just adventurous and looking for something new to try something they've never had, and like they're willing to spend a little bit of more money, but they also love to tell their friends that they discovered this thing. So right. trying to use the platforms to reach all of those. I'm just going to mute myself because I have to show my ticket. (laughs) Well, 
I I think this is is lovely and it's it's different in it, I, I'm I'm actually blanking on words which is really rare for me um, but the I think the I think the people who are out there who are tr- who want to find something different this is going to appeal to them because it is quality wine and it's very um, affordable and honestly like Catherine was saying it's something that not a lot of people have had so why not be the first one to share it with your friends and you know be a hero right, right. that's right. right try something new yeah right. yeah yeah right. there are always yeah. surprises in wine so yeah yeah it is and for those i mean there's so many people who who want that you know that century club and then the two time century club of all the different grape varieties you know that that you've tried you've got three different grape varieties that i just have right here that you can add to your yeah. to your century club mm-hmm. uh, thing mm-hmm. so I'm excited if the other wines taste anything like this one. I'm super excited to try them, um, especially the bubbles. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, I want to yeah. thank you. Oh, you just say one more thing. I didn't hear you. Yeah. I don't know if you're tra- Are you trying to talk, Catherine? Oh, me? Oh, yeah, I thought you were saying something. I'm sorry. Um, so I just want to thank you both for taking the time out of your busy schedules to... to. Oh, I was just going to say... Um, oh, yeah. Go ahead, Catherine. <laughs> uh, to talk about these wines. I, you know, like I said, I knew nothing about Armenia, so I'm happy, you know, I'm always looking to I think it's delayed. Things. I'm always looking to learn things and learn about new countries. And I think a lot of the people who are going to listen to this podcast are going to be excited to find something new that they can try. And I will have links to Storica so that they can uh, look it up. And, um, you know, thank you very much for sharing these wines with me. It's it's quite the experience. And it's it's wonderful to taste history and to know how much they're looking forward to advancing, building on their history. So thank you. Well, thank you for having us. It was a pleasure talking. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So I wish you guys both a wonderful night. I will, I know, Catherine, you're, you're probably, you don't have anything to drink, but <laughs> I raise a glass to we'll Armenian you. wines. And right. I don't know how you say it in Armenia, but I say slancha. So... Cheers, Blancha. Blancha. Okay. What language is Slancha? It's Gaelic. Gaelic, okay, Slancha. A little Irish, there we go. Slancha. <laughs> so thank you both. <laughs> thank you again. <laughs>